Hello, everyone. Yet once again, it's another day of fresh grace and mercy. This is the Guilt Grace Gratitude Podcast, where we bridge the gap to reformed Christian theology for your listening pleasure. Today is a book club episode, and we are excited to once again have Dr. Brandon D. Crow on. He's going to be talking about his new book, Why Did Jesus Live a Perfect Life? The Necessity of Christ's Obedience for Our Salvation published by Baker Academic. And in our show notes, there's going to be a link to Baker Academic. You can click that link and order yourself a copy of this book for yourself. There's also a couple other links there. There is one to find uh, a local church finder of a reformed church near you. That is the most important thing to find a church to call home. So uh, that website will take you to the closest reformed church in your area. So you can drop in and, and have a visit, as well as a link to the Society of Reformed Podcasters. This is a network of like-minded podcasts that we are a member of. If you enjoy our show and our content, most likely you're going to enjoy some of those other podcasts that we uh, group up with. And then there's another link for an information about Peter's Church here in about uh, next year in the summer, Santa Ana Reformed. And then, of course, some information, more information about Dr. Crow. So we'll jump in and introduce Dr. Crow. Yeah, if you guys weren't here or didn't start listening to us, this is towards the spring. We had Dr. Brandon Crow on for another book club episode. So he's, he's popping out books left and right, but he's the, the New Testament professor at Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. It's so not the one in California, two distinct seminaries. He teaches New Testament there, New, Tes New Testament introduction, some on the Gospels and Acts. Uh, and so, yeah, one of his areas of interest, one of his areas of uh, specializations in the Gospels. So we're, we are very excited to have you on to talk about this recent book, The, uh, the Obedience and Perfect Obedience of Jesus Christ. So thanks for coming on again. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you. So, um, so just maybe take us to the beginning and and what what interest to the very in very beginning just bring, yeah, bring yeah. us, bring yeah, us back is, to the beginning genesis, genesis one, chapter one. One. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no uh just All right since so the dawn of time yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. since you were at the apple of your father's eye let us know what happens since then yeah <laughs> no luckily the question is not Totally that is more of a, what what brought your interest into writing specifically on this topic from uh, Jesus's obedience? Well, this is the fruit of really several years of thinking through uh, one of the what I have found to be one of the more fascinating Christological questions, and that is what was Jesus doing, and how was he doing it? You know, what is the purpose of the incarnation, and what do we make of the life of Christ beyond simply uh, his death and resurrection. Uh, how do we think uh, really positively and integratively about the the incarnation, the childhood, the the entire life of Jesus? And uh, and there's these allusions to this throughout the Gospels and some really juicy quotes you will find. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Church fathers like uh, and John Calvin has a quote from the moment he took on flesh, he began to pay the. Mm. Uh, price of our redemption something to that effect yeah and the institutes i believe it's a 216.5 okay the institutes and uh, so this was a long-standing question and it really led me to my phd thesis topic which ended up being the role of deuteronomy as background for matthew's portrayal of jesus as obedient son of god huh. uh, and it really led as well to uh, a more comprehensive picture at least for the gospels called The Last Adam, where I looked at the obedience of Christ through the lens of Adam in the Gospels. Uh, and I had done some writing on this beyond that. So an article here, an article there, uh, and uh, really several articles. And this book, the genesis of this book was, hey, let me take some of the other things I have written that are not book length, and let's collect those and put those together. And uh, because I had written some really long articles on this, I thought it might be helpful to have a one volume that had several essays on the obedience of Christ in it, coming at the question from some different angles uh, than the book The Last Adam did, for example. And so I, I talked to uh, 
uh, Baker about it and, and they liked the idea, but they didn't want to reprint the essays. They suggested instead, and I think it was a good decision, that we basically rewrite the whole book. Oh, so okay. it, Easy. it wasn't my intention to, to write a book from <laughs> yeah. scratch. So the good news and the bad news was when I started writing this book, I didn't think I'd have to write a whole book. Uh, it was going to be a collection of essays. Hmm. Uh, that's, I guess, the bad news. But the good news is it turned into, I think, to a really nice, succinct, user-friendly volume. I addressed some questions I had never addressed before. Uh, and um, I had done the research, most of the research, when I started writing it. So it was a matter of thinking through how to present the material, how to rework some of the material. And so it combined several different essays uh, that I've worked on over the past mm. decade or so, but presents them at a more user-friendly level, mm. and then gets into some of the more contemporary debates that weren't even uh, as much of a debate when I began this process. So uh, in the end, it came out with a really nice, very readable book, I think. They put lo lots of text boxes, mm. uh, breakout boxes in the book. Um, it's not too long. And uh, it's designed to be accessible for anyone who's asking the question, what is the point of the entire life of Jesus and his obedience? Yeah, so you, I mean, <laughs> we were, before recording, Nick and I were talking about the, the table of contents, and the, uh, the word that most appears in the table of contents is obedience. So can you describe, so what, what is it, like, is it thematic, like, so what, and I know it sounds obvious, I think, to some of our crowd, but for those who, it doesn't sound obvious to what, why is Jesus' obedience so necessary for this project of yours? So the question that I'm, I'm really wanting to ask is, how does the life of Christ relate to the salvation of his people? At a more personal level is, is how am I saved by what Jesus did on earth? Mm -hmm. Now, the work of Christ is multifaceted. The doctrines of Christology, the person and work of Christ, uh, there are so many different things to cover. There are so many wonderful things to discuss. But one of the things I'm discussing in this book is primarily, not only, but primarily the work of Christ in what theologians call his estate of humiliation. That means his life under the law. Hmm. Uh, now, that includes the law of Moses, but also includes the law, the moral law of God, hmm. uh, more comprehensively in a way that reflects what was first given to Adam. And this is something that theologians have discussed, but if it is a true theological doctrine, it comes from Scripture. Hmm. And I think it is a true theological doctrine, and I think we do find ample discussion of this in Scripture. So that is the work of Christ as a new Adam, as a true human, uh, who as a man submits himself to God's law and obeys for the salvation of his people. Now, this is related to a lot of other doctrines as well. You cannot ignore the two natures of Christ in this discussion. Uh, you cannot ignore the work of Christ in his estate of exaltation, uh, which is referring to Christ's resurrection, ascension, uh, present heavenly session, and future return. All of those things are related as well. And so it would be artificial to break those off of this and, and say, I'm only talking about humiliation and only his humanity. Well, Christology doesn't always work that simply. You have to think through all of the, uh, the interrelated angles, and I'll do some of that in this book. Mm -hmm. But most of, of what this is about is, does the New Testament in particular teach that Jesus was fully obedient to God's law as one who was made under the law? And is that obedience portrayed in Adamic terms and representative terms? Uh, and I think it is. And so we'll look in, in this book. I look at the Gospels. I look at Acts. I look at Paul's letters, look at Romans 5, 1 Corinthians 15, Galatians 3, where it talks about the law and what is required of the law. Uh, we'll look at Hebrews and, and how you understand the work of Christ on earth in relation to his work in heaven. And then it will get into uh, some of the more synthetic uh, discussions, such as well, how does this relate to the exaltation of Christ? How does, it, does, does this relate to justification how I made right with God by faith alone. How does this relate to sanctification? How I grow in holiness and uh, where works, our works come into the picture in a way that they do not in justification. And so I seek to sort of navigate some tricky waters by looking at what Christ has done. And then how does that relate to the New Testament's very clear call to Christian discipleship? So it sounds like Jesus... Uh, through his obedience, 
conquered and uh, the covenant of works on, on our behalf where luckily when we're saved, we're not judged on our own obedience because right out of the gate, AKA out of the womb, we completely fail on obedience. So um, getting to heaven is through the covenant of works through Jesus, which is the covenant of grace, right? So, you know, we're not able to, to achieve the covenant of works through obedience on ourselves, obviously. So is his obedience somehow imputed to us at our justification? Yeah, that, that's the right term, imputed. And, and, and so much of this book is about the way that what Christ did as a representative, it helps explain some of these debates that have become debates and well, all the way back to the post-Reformation era at the Council of Trent, but mm -hmm. even debates today. And what does the term imputation mean? Uh, what, why do theologians say often in the Reformed tradition, uh, or the Reformed tradition as, as such says that uh, we are justified on the basis of an alien righteousness, uh, that is a, a righteousness that comes from Christ, that's not our own. It doesn't become our own in the sense that our good works are not fused together with Christ, but it's received by faith alone. And those are often discussions that focus on Paul's letters uh, and particular passages there and that uh, maybe Galatians and maybe Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. And, and I think that's right, that we are the righteousness is imputed to us and the righteousness that suffices for us for justification must be perfect. And therefore it cannot be anything we bring to the table. It must be received mm -hmm. by faith. And so faith is not a work. Uh, but faith is a, an instrument by which we benefit from what Christ has done completely. And so this is so important because when we're talking about Christ's obedience, we're talking about um, internal and external perfect obedience from the moment of his conception uh, and his birth all the way through his life. So even if we were to do the right thing and we did it with a mixed motive, we did it that's a sin. Even if we were to, to do the right thing externally, but we thought something evil in our hearts, that would be a sin. It is a sin. And so we need a perfectly holy Savior internally and externally to save us from uh, our inability to keep God's law perfectly in the way that is required. Mm -hmm. And so the imputation guards the perfection of what Christ has done as perfectly holy, uh, never sinning by any deed of uh, commission or omission, neither internally nor externally, but positively doing all that God requires internally and externally. And the wonderful good news of the gospel is our sins are covered based on what Christ has done for us because our obedience, though it is required, is not salvific. Mm. And we are, for justification, we are dependent totally upon the work of Christ. And it is my hope that this book will help highlight that precious truth in some, in maybe some fresh ways for some reason. Mm. Yeah, and even even one of your chapters too. So I'm looking through it. it says obedience of the perfect priest. So chapter chapter six. And I'm assuming most people are like, well, what does a priest have to do with obedience? So that they just make sacrifices and they're at the altar. So why why connect obedience and priesthood? Well, this uh, is a traditional way to think through the representative obedience of Christ on our behalf. It's helpful to remember the three offices of Christ: prophet, priest, and king, and how these can function as a helpful pedagogical guide for us to think through the various aspects of the work of Christ. Christ is always prophet, priest, and king, and this applies both to his work on earth, humiliation, and his work presently in heaven, exaltation. And in that chapter, I, I deal a lot with the book of Hebrews. And in Hebrews, I think most all scholars would agree that Hebrews teaches that Christ is a priest in heaven, uh, and uh, from there it gets fairly muddy. Uh, because hmm. sometimes people just say that Christ doesn't present a sacrifice on earth. The sacrifice is a heavenly sacrifice, not an earthly sacrifice. And, and so there's a lot of discussion in, in Hebrews studies about when and where did Christ offer his sacrifice. Hmm. Well, one angle that I don't think has been sufficiently discussed in some of those contemporary debates is whether we should think of the obedience of Christ, such as we find it in Hebrews 2 and 5 and 10, as a representative obedience that could be understood in priestly categories. Uh, at least the terms uh, may not be used, but the, the themes and the concepts are there. Uh, and that's the traditional reformed way to think through the obedience of Christ. It's priestly, it's his humiliation, and it's 
uh, it's, com it's connected, uh, it's integral to his death on the cross. And, and this is where we sometimes might also talk of both the active and the passive obedience of Christ, mm, yeah. which are two ways of describing one thing. That is Christ's one obedience. It's active means he did all that was required by God's law and passive in the sense of suffering. Patior is the Latin. Passive, not in the sense of being passive in the way that we think of that term in English, but in terms of suffering, penalty uh, that the, the law gives towards sin. So uh, when we're talking about Christ as priest, we're talking about the unity of his work on earth and work in heaven mm. and talking about the unity of his positive obedience throughout his life and the climactic act of that obedience in his death on the cross. And so in that chapter, I will get into more to Hebrews, but also other places, places in the Gospels as well, where the language of, of obedience and Christ's representation for us is construed in terms that could be called priestly. Mm. Yeah, and to maybe flip this question on its head, we, we all know, or we hopefully all know that, um, Jesus, as the second person of the Trinity, as fully God, fully man, was a perfect sacrifice, right? And if that was, and that is good news, uh, and if it just stopped there, it could be that as even an infant, he could have just been sacrificed. So does this kind of answer that question of why he had to live out a life of obedience through his earthly missionary mission work instead of just having his life ended as a as a baby he there was a reason why he had to live a life of obedience yeah i think that that's there is and there's a number of ways i think to come at that question i mean in terms of the priestly angle you see luke's gospel saying that jesus was about 30 when he began his ministry which may yeah. well be a priestly reason there uh but but the way that Paul, so let's go to the scripture here, and the way that Paul describes the work of Christ, he, um, to, to understand this question, we need to wrestle with Romans 5, mm -hmm. and I, I, I think that some do that well, and other studies sort of skip over that, uh, but Romans 5 describes the unified obedience of Christ as uh, Adamic righteousness, or Adamic obedience, meaning it's like Adam, and 1 Corinthians 15 is very similar. And so with uh, the coming of Christ, we have one who is going to relive and overcome the disobedience of Adam, disobedience of Israel as well, but there's a distinctive role for Adam there. And um, this means that he is going to be prophet, priest, and king. I think you can make the argument that Adam was prophet, priest, and king. Uh, and then you have these various uh, institutions in the Old Testament of prophet, priest, and king. But they come back together in Christ, and and as one who has now reached the age of uh, of maturity, he lives. Uh, Irenaeus, the church father, interestingly says that Jesus goes through every stage of life, sanctifying yeah. every age. Yeah. Uh, now uh, he uh, thinks Jesus was over fifty or so when he died because hmm. of the passage in John eight, which is an interesting take on that. That Jesus also was an old man, uh, or over fifty, uh, in that the more mature age of of manhood, uh, which is an interesting way to think about it. There's a certain aesthetic quality that Irenaeus, the church father, I think likes about that. Hmm. Uh, and it fits with John 8, but I, it, at the very least, we could say he went through the stages of life and sanctified every age, hmm. including uh, manhood. Uh, and there's maybe some other angles we can look at from that angle. Uh, but, but to come back to the, your question, it makes a difference how he died as well, because he did not simply die an accidental death or die um, uh, in way in another way that was uh, not public, but he died as a public representative. He died as a legal curse bearer. And so Reformed theologians will often point this out, uh, that Jesus' death on a cross, look at Galatians 3, for example, as a curse uh, was made a public curse for us. Uh, that ensures that just as surely as Christ bore that legal penalty, we can be sure that all of our sins are nailed to the cross uh, through him and um, uh, and that they can no longer come back on us because he has put them to death. And in his new life through, through the resurrection ensures that his sacrifice was perfect. So to be raised from the dead 
Jesus had to be perfect uh, because uh, otherwise sin may have had a claim on him, but it did not. As one who was completely free from sin his whole life, he was served as the final, uh, not only was he the final priest, but the final priestly sacrifice, both the lamb and, uh, and the priest. Then his offering is perfect. It is final. It does not need to be repeated. He did not have to offer a sacrifice for himself, but by being raised from the dead, we see the perfection of his humanity and his priestly work, and he reigns in heaven now as an exalted priest and uh, prophet, priest, and king in heaven. So uh, those are some of the ways I would come at that question. Yeah, and uh, attached to that question too, and you talked about this at the beginning of the recording. Um, so some ways since, since your doctoral dissertation, some ways development of kind of improper views or uh, misunderstandings of Jesus' obedience or his, his sacrifice and why he had to obey. So what, what are some of these popular understandings or misunderstandings of his obedience or of the atonement um, that have come out in the last couple of years that either your book directs or uh, it talks about directly or just by implication of like, this is the correct view. Here are some other ways that other people understand this versus how I think the Bible understands this Reformed theology. Yeah, that's really the key question I'm coming at in this book. And I've put one key question there in the introduction that guides the book. And you can kind of see that question in the title. And that is, is perfect obedience necessary for our justification? In many mm. ways, that's the question of the book. Yeah. Perfect, entire, whole obedience. Now, the reason that's such an important question is because there have been studies from various angles uh, that either do not wrestle with that question sufficiently or uh, sort of redirect the question. Uh, for example, uh, many studies in the New Perspective on Paul. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's come up on your podcast. Yeah, a little bit. Yep, yep. Yeah, the New Perspective on Paul is a, a diverse range of readings of Paul, but more or less says that justification is more about the Jew and Gentile relationship in the church uh, and less about how sinners are made right with God. Yeah. And, and you even will, will have some of the more popular renderings say um, it, it's about um, uh, th there's a justification by faith and a justification by works, or uh, we are justified on, on the basis of our spirit uh, wrought good works in us. Uh, that's one angle or, or one general description of the way that discussion can go. And so then our works become part of the foundation in some way for the way that we are made right with God. But that paradigm suffers uh, from not wrestling with the question sufficiently or at least accurately, uh, whichever one it is, whether our works can add anything and whether our works mm -hmm. are sufficient. And, and of course, whether the scripture says that. Mm -hmm. And there are others who say... Um, uh, for example, that uh, faith is something we do. Faith is active. And certainly faith is active. It, it depends on what you mean by that. But faith historically understood as an instrument, uh, not a work as such. And that's crucial because if faith is a work, then is it perfect or is it imperfect? Uh, and mm. if it is imperfect, then it's not sufficient for justification. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but if faith, though imperfect, can receive and rest upon the righteousness of another, uh, well, that is what i think the best answer is mm -hmm. and so in this book i'm trying to answer that question is perfect obedience mm -hmm. necessary for eternal life for salvation for justification and my answer is you can probably guess yes it is <laughs> yeah yeah a and the reason that the new testament writers present jesus as fully perfectly representatively obedient is because of that question mm -hmm. and the way that faith is an instrument is important as well here because faith is what rest on what christ has done uh, we cannot fix it we cannot add to it we cannot supplement it and say we rest on it even as we are called to a discipleship that's a real call hmm. uh, but it's not the foundation of our justification and that's a crucial distinction that i think is biblical and, and is helpful to to understand hmm. yeah so it's yeah, you're, you're distinguishing between the the thing that the faith is placed on that has all the merit versus putting some sort of weird merit in the hmm. faith that puts onto that object am i am i catching that yeah. correctly that, that's right and uh, this is a debate that's been around for a long time uh, you, you may have he heard about the socinians or your listeners or if you read ancient, uh, ancient uh, older works of theology yeah. you will see the socinians mentioned and it doesn't take you too long to figure out that they're not positively portrayed in most reformed works yeah and this was a debate with the 
you know, the uh, 17th century era uh, in particular, where faith was construed by the Socinians as a work. Uh, mm-hmm. And in response, the reform said, no, faith is not a work, it's an instrument. Mm-hmm. So uh, some of these debates that we are seeing today are not entirely new, but uh, it's helpful to look at the past to see, uh, and I do some of that in the book, look at the past, how have these been answered? Uh, but the book is also a, about a, a constructive exegetical argument for some some old positions and maybe some fresh takes as well. Mm. That, that is that is consistent with the reform take, but but a different a different way of thinking about some of those questions as well. Yeah. Yeah, and I've heard it also said before. That, um, we aren't saved by faith; we're saved through faith by Christ. So yeah, and, and it depends on how, how one uses the, the prepositions. But mm-hmm. um, uh, a lot of you can look at Ephesians two eight and nine say by grace through faith or by christ through faith yeah that through faith is is, is helpful way to think about it not mm-hmm. um and this also gets to uh, the judgment according to works question some would mm-hmm. say we are justified on the basis of works which is the same thing as saying justified according to our works mm-hmm. uh, but the post-reform dogmaticians has typically made a distinction here uh, all the way up to you know modern day interpreters as well that based on is not the same thing as according to Mm-hmm. And the Bible doesn't say based on our works. It says according to. And that mm-hmm. distinction is subtle, but, but uh, significant. And that uh, we're, we're, uh, we're judged according to what we have done, but not, to, not the foundation. Uh, the foundation is the work of Christ. And, and so this is one of the chapters is called the foundation of, or the basis of justification. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't want to give away the argument of the book, but that basis is not our works. That basis mm-hmm. is the work of Christ. Yeah. His obedience yeah. is the basis or foundation of our justification. Yeah, it sounds like the the point is uh, the object of our faith is Christ. That's right. It, it's the uh, is faith though weak uh, if it is uh, grasping the right object is is mm-hmm. sufficient as the means that God has appointed. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I have I have two concluding um, questions, and um, so I'll, I'll ask one, and then and Nick can go, and then I'll ask the last one. So. Um, kind of in the middle of your book, too, part, part two, exegesis, it says Jesus' obedience and salvation in the Gospels. And so I'm assuming just thinking of your average person, so, you know, I, I see and I hear Paul talking a lot about Jesus' obedience, about the stuff that he did. But I don't see explicit references in the Gospels about Jesus' obedience, about the things he's doing. So what, what argument are you making in this? And what can you show to people in the Gospels? No, in the Gospels, it's the same thing. Paul's pulling from the Gospels itself. Yeah, I, I would... In the book, I open it with an illustration that if you live in London and you pass by Westminster Abbey or Big Ben every day, you may not give it a second glance. Or if you, you know, cross, um, uh, you know, the Thames River every day, or if you're if you live in London and you uh, travel down the Champs Elysees for uh, for work, or you pass by the Eiffel Tower, uh, you may not give it a second glance. But people will come from all over the world to look at these things. And uh, that's what I think we have in the Gospels, is it's mm. right there in front of us, but we're not used to reading it this way. Mm. And, and what we see in the Gospels is Jesus is a public representative, new Adam, new Israel figure, who is not simply a, a private individual going around teaching people. He's teaching, of course, but underneath it all, there is this large program of accomplishing redemption, Matthew 121. You will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Well, how do we see that in the Gospels? Mm. Well, it opens, the Gospels open with the baptism of Jesus. Here he enters into his public ministry. He's a representative, and he goes into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. That's a representative work on our behalf. He is fighting a spiritual battle there, and he is defeating the devil. And and you see the Adamic imagery there in mark's temptation account maybe more clearly mm-hmm. because in mark there's no quotations mm. from the old testament it's yep. simply he was with the wild animals and you're like yep. oh what happened there <laughs> yeah. it's probably a, re- a reversal of the wilderness a return yeah. to Eden, and an adamic imagery there so he's portrayed as a new adam luke's gospel goes straight from the baptism to a genealogy that ends with adam yep. and then you go to uh, the temptation so if we think of the temptation accounts as hmm. public uh spiritual warfare mm. then they that opens up some new angles for us to see jesus fighting a, a battle with the devil there's a parable he gives the, the binding of the strong men and that parable is really a parable for his ministry jesus is the stronger man 
who binds the strong man, the devil, and mm. plunders his household and sets people free. And there again, you see a spiritual battle between Jesus and the devil. Uh, when Jesus gives his life, he gives it as, as a ransom for many. There again, it's a, uh, it, it's a substitutionary and public work of Christ. His death is public. His resurrection is public as well in the sense mm. that uh, he appears to the disciples. He appears to more than 500 at once. And so in the Gospels, don't miss, in, in light of all the wonderful things that are going on, don't miss the fact that Jesus is accomplishing salvation through all that he does. And so that's mm. the way I would uh, mm. maybe encourage readers, or your listeners to, uh, to look, is, is look at the temptation accounts and allow that to be a springboard <laughs> to see how Jesus is fighting the devil in uh, conquering the devil by casting out demons and so forth as well. The kingdom coming means the kingdom of God is advancing against the kingdom of darkness. Yeah, and that's, and that's a good point, too, because I, I think we're kind of as evangelical readers, we're used to reading, and we like the precepts, we like being told, like, hey, here's, here's what's done, but we're not used to narratives, we're not used to how to read narratives, and see, like, how you're saying that this narrative is, is set in the midst of a long line or a long understanding of representation of obedience, versus just being, and not saying that, obviously, Paul, Paul's doing something different than what the Gospels are doing, but the, the same concept, the same, the same thing, uh, but it's, yeah, it's a, it's a different way of reading kind of an epistle being told, hey, here's, here's, the, here's the implications versus reading a narrative. It's like, how do we read this narrative in the same way that Paul's reading this narrative? Right. And when you read a narrative, the first question is not always, where can I put myself in this story? Yeah. It might be if it's a parable or something, but yeah. the question might be, what did Christ do for me in this story? Mm. And that might be something to ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and knowing... Only God can achieve perfect obedience post fall. And thankfully he came to us to do that on our behalf, having Christ as our mediator so that we can be in him uh, versus being in Adam. And so hopefully our audience is hearing this. And if, if you're not a believer yet, you're, you're thinking, how can I be in God's family? How can I, you know, go from being, um, under the judgment of my obedience, which I know right out of the womb is failed. And how can I be under the obedience of Christ? How God can look at me with the same obedience record as his, his son, Jesus, which is just astonishing and humbling. My question is, how do we know if Jesus's obedience has been imputed to us? How do we know for sure? A, a assurance question. Yeah, that's a question that, that is, is a good question. I don't think I address it in the book. Mm. Uh, how do we know? Well, um, 1 John was written with that question in mind. Yeah. And, and the, three, uh, the three tests or the three principles there in 1 John, uh, it can be taken a number of ways. But one is simply the promises of God, holding on to what God has said, uh, that uh, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to us from all unrighteousness and so there's the promises of god that the objective work of christ on our behalf that he did it and we believe it another is the the role of the holy spirit in encouraging our hearts and, and, and testifying to us um and by the way these three points from first john closely mirror uh, the westminster confession of faith mm -hmm. uh, and, and the way that it speaks about assurance uh, and a third way is there is corroboration from our lifestyle and uh, that doesn't mean our lifestyle saves us but uh, first John is written to encourage those who are walking in the light that they're on the right track. And it doesn't mean that no one could ever walk in the light. Otherwise there would be no encouragement or mm. no uh, assurance, but for those who need assurance and, and who should have assurance because they are in the light. First John talks about, are we living in a way that's consistent with what God uh, desires? Are we loving those around us? Are we hating our brother? Or are we loving our brother? Are we uh, concerned about those around us? Or are we not concerned? Are we, agreeing in our doctrine with what the apostles taught and, and the the danger in first john is that the johnny come lately's come in mm. and tell people don't worry about what the apostles told you i have a new word so there's the the objective realities of what christ has done it, it must be paramount and then uh, if we believe that uh, he is who he says he is and we ag agree with what the new testament writers say and then that's a a significant step and towards assurance and yeah so those, and those are the three things that that first john gives i think it's helpful uh 
And so the, it's not as though our lives play no impact on this at all, uh, but they're not primary. They're, they're, they're a tertiary or a, a corroboratory, a corroborative, I don't know the right word there. <laughs> yeah. They provide yeah. corroboration yeah. That, uh, for our confession. Our confession should match our lifestyle. And, um, and the way we know it's for us is that we, we simply take him up on the offer of uh, repent. Jesus says in Mark, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, mm -hmm. believe in the gospel. <clears throat> and uh, that gospel is focused on Christ himself. Mm -hmm. And so we turn away from ourselves and turn away from trusting in what we can bring to the table. And um, sometimes that means, often it means turning from self-righteousness. I think I'm bringing a lot here. This is a really good deal for God. Mm -hmm. Well, no, none <laughs> of our works are, are, are mm -hmm. capable of even helping us be saved. Uh, and instead, we rest entirely on Christ and throw ourselves on his mercy. Uh, mm. uh, maybe one final illustration that Jesus mm. gives in Luke 18 would be helpful. The parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Uh, one man prays and he thanks God for all the good things in his life uh, and for all the good things he's done. The other man's a tax collector that's socially uh, on a, in a different category, not respected. Uh, and not a lot of people probably want to hang out with him. But he just says, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And who went down to his house justified, Jesus at? It, it's the one who said, be merciful to me, a sinner. And uh, I think that's the posture that, that I hope this book helps us to take, mm. that we, we need God's mercy. We are sinners, and there's nothing we can bring to the table. So we, mm. uh, we throw his, ourselves on his mercy and ask him to cover us in the blood of Christ. <clears throat> oh, yeah, that's that's, so good. that reminds me of your, yeah, your implications, yeah, part three. So after you go through definitions then exegesis has thrown us yeah how the how the bible talks about this your implication so as we're ending out you, your last chapter what is required is finished and after, before this is obedience and justification so how kind of ending this out how does how does jesus's obedience relate to our obedience well uh, the, the way that it all comes back together is we must be in christ uh, and jesus's obedience is uh, it is our hope, as as Bavink puts it, Herman Bavink, for example, we don't need more from Christ. We need Christ himself. Mm. Uh, we need to be united to him. And that's the primary thing to take away is that we need to be found in Christ. Now, it, when it comes to the question of sanctification, that also flows from our union with Christ. But sanctification is a necessary step uh, for redeemed people. That is, mm -hmm. sanctification is not optional. That is, growth and holiness is required. The call to discipleship is real, but the distinction, the logical distinction is very important here, whereas justification, we can add nothing to the equation, nothing. And so we are called to work by the power of God's spirit, and we grow. Now, there's something called definitive sanctification, which means mm -hmm. we are once for all set apart, but most people use the term, and the way I use it here is for progressive growth and holiness, for growth and maturity, and so we are still called to obey. What does that look like? Well, uh, our consciences are not beholden to any person and what they would require of us, but only what God requires of us. And look at the Ten Commandments as a helpful blueprint for what God continues to require of us today. Uh, our works are not perfect. We don't need to think they are, even if we are redeemed in Christ. But God is pleased to accept the works of those who are in Christ and by the blood of the Son. Westminster Confession of Faith, I think it's 16.6. Mm -hmm. So our works are, are imperfect, but God is pleased. We have a relationship with God, and, and he is pleased even with imperfect acts of obedience from his children. Hmm. And so we don't simply throw up our hands and say, I can never do anything anyway. Instead, we, we seek to make progress, to grow in maturity, uh, to use the means of grace God has given to us, uh, to grow in our relationship with him and in our fellowship with Christ. And uh, where we do that, then good work should follow. Hmm. Uh, and... Um, and yet those good works are not the foundation of our justification. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it sounds like what we're called to do is we must deny ourselves by repenting, even if we're already confessionally saved uh, Christians. We must keep repenting, keep denying ourselves. Um, and the first step really is knowing that we are born sinners, separated from God, and we need a Savior that is God himself. That's right. Uh, and so we, on a day-to-day -day basis, we, we should repent from our sins. And the, the confession puts it, repent of particular sins particularly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, that does not, uh, there also is a sort of once for all coming to Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, that is justification. And that is to say, I, I forsake all of my sin uh, 
I, I don't trust in anything that I have done, but I trust in what Christ has done for me. And that's the prayer God loves to answer. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's, this is something you talk about all throughout your book, obedience, justification, um, some aberrant, some outside of the, the, the faith or the, the confessional faith. Um, but yeah, thanks. Thanks for writing this. Thanks for coming on again. And just it, where can people find you? Is there anything else that you're working on? I feel like I, I've, they've, we've, they've had two podcasts with Dr. Crow on, and I've read both of those books and I want more of Dr. Crow. I want to read more yeah. of his stuff. He helps, he helps me understand scripture a little bit better. Um, you have, after this, you have anything else that you're working on that you, if you, if you want to sneak preview for anybody else who's, who's listening? Uh, well, thank you for those kind words. I, I'm, I, the thing I'm working on now is I'm, uh, Lord willing, uh, finishing up a manuscript on the doctrine of the person and the work of Christ, huh. uh, work on Christology due in uh, December of this year. So I don't know when it will come out, uh, but that, that, that's what I'm currently working on finalizing. And it covers Old Testament, New Testament, Huh. Uh, systematic theological categories and then practical payoff and church history okay uh, so it, it's quite um <laughs> it's, that's a it's a big book a to Z. yeah it, it covers a lot so I, i'm excited about it it's been a, a wonderful experience writing this and learning things that and reading things i haven't had the chance to read before mm. uh, and so this is sort of a preview of that it's mm. a, okay. a more focused discussion on one aspect uh but this would be sort of one section of one chapter in a bigger work on <laughs> okay, gotcha yeah yeah mm. cool yeah so if, after you guys read this one you're like oh this is just a sneak preview of what's coming down the road so i'm i'm, I'm hoping i'm sure people who read this like i, I need more of this stuff so uh that's it's well, yeah, we need more we, we we need more of these works um but that that sounds good yeah i like your writing style because it is um it allows you to think more learn more it's deep enough but it's not too overwhelming for like a lay person it's not too heady and academic but it's still just as deep hmm. as academic books i think yeah 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 that's well, the feedback you know, we got from the first one yeah 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 mm -hmm. I, I think that's one of the things that you know there are different audiences for different books but yeah. i one of the goals is always to make things understandable and so whether yeah. you're a pastor you know, with your teacher or whatever it is. And, and, and there is something to be said for complexity. There's also something to be said for trying to make things simple. And this is one of those books where I'm doing my best to sort of cut through the fog and just say, yep. this has been helpful for me. Mm. If we ask this one question, I think it will help bring clarity to some of these issues. <clears throat> thank you for doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for, yeah, for writing this, for, for pointing people to Christ in this finished work because we need more of these works produce on a more consistent basis and, and you're kind of on, in the line of those who are doing it so thanks thanks yeah. for writing this thanks for coming on and, and hopefully we can have you on again in the future yeah thanks a lot guys it's been my pleasure to be on yeah thank you god bless